when I uh, shared my presentation with Alice, I heard this, oh, thanks, that's great. But it's really, really long, and please can you stick to time? So uh, apologies, I'm actually going to read from a script because otherwise I will start rambling on. So as Catherine said, I'm Helen, I manage strategy policy, and it has been one of the greatest pleasures of my career to develop this plan, our management plan, Vodol Abanai, Abanai the Future, which is all about looking to our landscape, to our past, to understand the needs of our future. Um, I, when I give this, when I show this slide, I usually say, I'm strategy and policy manager for Banner Brechaniog, which feels like an act of revolution every time I say that. Um, and it still does feel that way, but that reclaiming of our heritage is all bound up in this new way of thinking about managing the park and in the story I'm going to tell you today. But first, I'm going to start with a bit of a confession. I'm a town planner by training, not by design, it has to be said. Something I ended up doing. Um, what I am is a national park geek. Seriously, that really is what I am. And I have no problem admitting that, unlike my time planning status. This picture here is an actual picture of my 11th birthday present, which I begged my parents for, which is a fact pack of all things National Park, produced by the Campaign for National Parks. Um, and the coolest, I mean, it's pretty cool, right? But the coolest thing about it was that it had a poster in it of all the national parks in England and Wales. There weren't any in Scotland. Um, and I had that very proudly on my wall next to my Kylie and Jason posters, which will date it perfectly. Some kids love dinosaurs, some collect Barbies, me, top 10 facts for national parks. And actually, it's unsurprising that I coveted this artifact and still treasure it to this day because this was the upbringing I had, basically playing in national parks in the UK. And Bracken Beacons, Banner Brechaniog, was one of my favorite places to be. I grew up believing national parks were special places because my dad, old socialist that he was, taught me the story that national parks were gifts to the nation. He told me the story of the kinder trespass, how ordinary men and women stood up to the guns in the hands of the hired men, from the rich who owned the land, when they wanted to reclaim the right to walk in the countryside. And how when the war ended, Atlee's government, who were good people with good hearts, had made the NHS that saved my life once, and had made these national parks as gift to the nation for me to go and play in whenever we wanted to. And to, so to me, national parks, like doctors, <laughs> were good people with good hearts who were looking after the landscape and the culture of this place, for everyone. So naturally, I grew up wanting to work in national parks or be a doctor. Sadly, my grades weren't good enough to be a doctor, so I ended up in national parks. I thought I'd actually use my archaeology degree, yes, I am one of you, um, to be an archaeologist in a national park. Alice, I still kept it. But I ended up working in admin, and the rest is a fully paid up master's in planning and 15 years worth of uh, writing policy. By the way, it's a rambling introduction to tell you that I'm a planner. I love national parks because they are magical gifts to the nation. I've been trained as an archaeologist, so I instinctively work on landscape scales. I value the stories of the past because they inform our future. I also believe in the power of a plan to bring about social and environmental change. And it's all context, funnily enough, I'm a planner and an archaeologist, so it's all about the context, right? Uh, for the story I'm going to tell, which is about a statutory need to write the management plan. This is a, one of the things that we have to do by law. But it's actually transformed the way that we think about the park. This story, like all good stories, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the beginning is rooted in our understanding of the National Park. And it's a bit of a tragedy and sad to say. Evidence of massive levels of decline in relation to our biodiversity, retreating woodland areas, a lot of ancient woodland, and a lower proportion of our protected sites, including, sadly, our heritage assets in good management or in favorable condition inside our boundary and then outside. That's a really interesting of an economic system that's so dominated by tourism with its seasonal low pay, that wages have fallen so low and house prices growing so high that we're facing not only a massive need for a different type of housing than the one that we're actually providing, 
But the loss of young people to the extent that we're worried we'd be left with a community of retirees, where we lose that continuity of the stories of our connections to the past and to the place. And the infrastructure completely unable to meet the demands being placed on it, but the only option is to travel by car and that the special qualities of the National Park are at threat from their own success. And of course, there was a bit of a plot twist during all of this. And the other part of the story is COVID. Now, I have no words for what COVID was as a temporary suspension of time and space, but it was a transformative event in good and bad ways. It both closed down worlds, but its liminality opens up possibilities of a paradigm shift. That mantra of build back better hang in the air and gave the context in which I find myself here um, uh, when we started to put together the management plan. Now, I swapped my lovely, safe, cosy office and commute across the beacons for this homeschooling to young kids and going slightly insane. There was something impressive, oh, impressive? Yeah, it was pretty impressive, oppressive about that. You know, trying to deal with these really big issues that Park were facing and how we manage ourselves out of that. And that felt immovable, but also caught in the pressure cooker of a life confined to four walls and four humans. So like most people, that Boris walk, that hour's exercise with a lifeline, as were books, audio books in particular, which used to accompany me on my walks. And this is where our story really starts to take off with a book called Donut Economics and a walk up a, up a hill behind my house in a gun lice on the edge of the park into this vast post-industrial landscape. Now, as I walked, I listened to Kate talk about this new economic model, and I got more and more engrossed, and I walked further and further and further until I was immersed in Kate's words, but deep in this post-industrial landscape on the fringe of And Kate, because she narrates it, was talking about the need to change the story from one that measures um, consumptive outcomes to live in a different way, with different goals, different measures of success to be aiming for, like how we are connected to our, we, sorry, like how we are connected to our natural environment, like cultural awareness, like telling the stories of our past, like celebration. And perhaps it's something to do with this vast landscape I was immersed in. Now, this is a palimpsest landscape a landscape where the layer upon layer of human interaction is plain to see. I am actually standing on a common. There are sheep grazing. This is the agrarian. I've walked up this trackway, which is actually an old um, tram line um, linking down into uh, from an old coal mine, a deep mine, down to a railway line below. I can see an open cast. Uh, the open cast is coming around. There's an open cast um, mine there. That mine is going to close. It's going to become a high-speed train railway testing centre of excellence. There's wind turbines, and those are the hills of the park. All of these things, this landscape, was showing us that change was normal and possible and necessary. And that message of the need to change the story for something regenerative felt pretty important and profound and something that we needed to help guide our management plan for the park. Standing there in this landscape, looking into the park, connected to an ancient past, but surrounded by the successions of that past, helped me think that the future isn't actually set in stone. And my forebears just put, hadn't, sorry, my forebears hadn't just situated a failing system. They changed things up, and that gave us opportunity to do that. So that inspired us to actually plot out the system that we were working with. Um, so we took all our published data and we put it against this, which is we call our donut for obvious reasons. This bit here, this lovely purple space, this is the safe space. Sorry if <laughs> they're filming and <laughs> I've just walked around. So this is the safe space. This is where we want to get. So these lines here, this big, thick green line, this is our environmental limits. This smaller line here is our social foundation. So essentially, we want to make sure that we manage the park in such a way that we don't overshoot any of the sustainability of natural resources, 
and we make sure that everybody has opportunity for access to um, good quality of life. And those red wedges show how far away we are from that. So this system that we're looking at here is actually one of creeping decline. When you talk about shifting baseline syndrome, this is it, actually, because the green line is the real baseline. And we are these red wedges away from it. And they, those red wedges aggregate the effort needed, effort in terms of behavior change, legislative change, money spent, resources employed, changes to market forces or the values that underpin this system. That effort that is needed to get us back into a place where we're sustainably managing the park for people in place. So we started to call this the vital signs of the park. You know, it's like when you take your blood pressure, you don't know what your blood pressure is. You don't know about the problem until somebody takes a reading. And by looking at that beautiful landscape, you wouldn't know there was a problem until somebody takes a reading. Everything looks fine. We took this donut on the road as a conversation starter, this read out of the issues as an honest reflection of where we were and where we should go. And what it taught us is it wasn't enough to look at one sector. The biggest wedge there is climate change, but you can't look at climate change in isolation because the pull on the environment is related to the way that people use that environment. The way people use the environment is related to how the environment functions. Those things have to work together. And from there, the plan was born. The bottle, Abanai, Abanai, the future, a celebration through art, story, poetry of this special place. It's people doing amazing things. It's a bold call to action framed through five interconnect interconnected, interrelated and embedded missions which seek to build transformative change for people, place and environment. We have a mission for our climate to reach net zero by 2035. We want to achieve clean, safe, resilient, plentiful water resources and water environments by 2030. And um, very interestingly, we've got a, a, a talk on the escalator and that's a river really close to my heart because that is actually in real state fine at present. Our nature mission is to create a nature positive Banai Brachainio National Park by 2030 for people to live, work, visit safely, equitably and sustainably. And then finally, place where it all comes together, beautiful, thriving, and sustainable places celebrated for their natural and cultural heritage now and forever. Which, in doing this, it means adding our own layer into that palimpsest landscape writ large across our environment. As we shift from extractive and exploitive lin linear outcome-based management to something regenerative, distributive, circular, and collaborative. And that's what today really is about. We call this future ban I thinking, a shift in the mindset from one which seeks, which just does what it can with the resources it has, to another way of thinking, which calls out where we need to get to, and then inspires everyone who cares and loves the park to join with us. Maybe. The plan itself, the Bottle of Banna, it's clear, it's just a framework across a vast landscape, both in terms of policy and theme and geographic scope. The delivery of Mission Banai is dependent on a range of more detailed, action oriented plans developed with all those at a stake in the park. Uh, like the plan we are celebrating today, which points out on the year, the Historic Environment Action Plan which does the heavy lifting in terms of thinking about how we take this vision and transform it into the management of the historic environment of the future. And this plan defines what future bound life thinking means for the most precious of assets of our territory. Now, just like the plan, the Devolta Labana and the management plan can't set out all the details and we need those um, plans that sit underneath for, in the, like the historic environment action plan to break, meet on the bones. We, as Bana Brechaino of National Park Authority, cannot do the work alone. For those of you who sat through this presentation before, thank you very much, you will have heard me say this a few times, um, and it is based on the best parenting advice I've ever had, which is, it takes a village to raise a child. It is a mantra of mine. It will take a village to make the changes that we need in the management of this landscape, in the implementation of our missions. 
we are dependent wholly on the partnerships that form around the vision of this plan, on the collective action of organisations, individuals, statutory bodies, passionate volunteers to collaborate to develop way more than the sum of parts. As our now rather historic guidance, which was published in 2007, about what National Park Management Plan should do, they said partnership working is central to the delivery of sustainable development within the national parks because of the range of interests that it convenes. So we do not work alone when it comes to delivering the missions of the Banai. We are dependent on the help, the expertise, the advice, practical skills of a range of partners working with us towards our collective aims. And nowhere has this process of delivery been better reflected than in the work of the Historic Environment Partnership and their achievements. In pulling together to understand how our mission to create thriving, beautiful, prosperous places celebrated for their cultural and natural heritage can be delivered for a focus on collectively enhancing our historic environment. Now, one of the outcomes that the management plan sets out is around historic places. And it says something along the lines of, we want to create places where the culture and the historic environment is in good condition, you know, it's valued, it's celebrated, it's understood by residents and visitors alike, and where the synergy between managing the historic assets actually help us understand how we manage our landscape. Now, those are very, very pretty words. And they're very easy for me as a policy writer to put in a plan. The hard work is for how you actually make that happen. And that has been developed through the Historic Environment Action Plan, the HEAP. It's transformed those nice words into an action plan that's viable, realizable for the park. And it's laid out that pathway, that action plan towards creating those outcomes on the ground. And it's been inspiring to watch come into fruition. And I hope that the experience of that partnership will help build other partnerships across the park, looking at those other spokes on that diagram that I showed you. Other key areas of landscape management will learn from the work of the partnership. This is future ban I thinking, not just in ambition or direction of travel, but in the way of working. And with that, I think I've said way too much. And I'll hand you over to Paul Belford, who, along with the wonderful Alice Thorne, who's hiding somewhere managing stuff, have made this partnership so successful. Thanks.